I'm Louise Richardson from the University of York in the UK. Thank you very much to John for giving me the opportunity to talk about flavour and the senses with such well-informed commentators. Um, I'm really excited to be involved in the new developments of philosophy of brains and I look forward to following future mind and language symposia. What follows is a brief summary of my paper to get us started. Enormous thanks to Barry Smith, Fiona McPherson, Matthew Nudds and Moen Mathin for taking part. I'm certain I'm going to learn a great deal from reading and thinking about your commentaries. The focus of my paper was whether scientific findings tell us that flavours are perceived in part with a sense of smell. Do such findings, that is, solve the following puzzle? So consider how one's experience of flavour is impoverished when one holds one's nose or has a cold. Is what is impoverished one's taste experience or has one lost the olfactory component of the experience of flavour? My hope was that reflecting on that rather narrow issue would be helpful in answering the broader question of whether, and if so how, science can correct or indeed confirm our judgments about which sense we've perceived something with on some occasion, I call these sensory judgments. This is related, of course, to a broader question still, that of the role of science in telling us how to classify mental items more generally. I argued that scientific findings about flavour perception do not establish that we're wrong to think that flavours are just tasted. They don't show us that what we lose when we hold our noses when eating is the olfactory component of the flavour experience. The first part of the argument for this conclusion takes off from the observation that if scientific findings are to correct some judgement of ours about the modality to which an experience belongs, they must show that something to which we're committed in making that judgement is false. But what are we committed to in making sensory judgments? This, I think, is an interesting and a difficult question. Just what is it that we're up to in our thought and talk about the five familiar senses? I suggested that there are two sorts of view one might have of the everyday conception of the senses that underlies our sensory judgments. On a naturalist view of our everyday conception of the senses, it involves commitments about what distinguishes the senses that are hostage to empirical fortune. Commitments about, roughly, similarities and differences in how perceivings are produced by the effect of the environment on our internal perceptual equipment. Obviously, these sorts of commitments can be shown to be false by science. So, if naturalism is true of our everyday conception of the senses, then findings about the psychology of flavour perception might show that something to which our everyday conception of the senses commits us is false. And in that way, it might show us that perceivings of flavour are not merely taste experiences, but experiences of smell or olfactory experiences too. One way of understanding this sort of naturalism about our everyday conception of the senses is as the view that the senses are natural kinds, that we in our everyday thought and talk are having a first and somewhat unsuccessful shot at identifying. A non-naturalist about our everyday conception of the senses does not think of our thought and talk about the senses in this way. I call non-naturalist any view about our everyday conception of the senses that does not take it to involve the sorts of empirical commitments just mentioned. Characterised in this way, negatively, non-naturalism is consistent with a number of different positive views about how the senses are distinguished from one another. One such view is Matthew Nudd's conventionalism about the distinction between the senses, defended in his 2004 paper, The Significance of the Senses. Other non-naturalist views are available. I outline one other possible view in the paper. I don't argue in favour of non-naturalism, but, I suggest, non-naturalism is a plausible view of our everyday conception of the senses, and in particular, it's not shown to be false by findings in the psychology of flavour perception 
So, the findings leave open that non-naturalism is true, and thus that science does not tell us that perceivings of flavour are olfactory, by telling us that they're brought about by the effect of the environment on our internal perceptual equipment in just the way that olfactory experiences are. I take it that this first part of my argument is quite straightforward. It says, if you're going to claim to correct some judgment of ours, you need to determine what we're committed to in making that judgment. And in the case of the senses, that's not a straightforward matter. The second part of the argument appears in sections 4 and 5. There, I consider whether one might argue more directly that flavours are perceived in part by the sense of smell, without adjudicating between naturalism and non-naturalism. And one might try to do this in two ways. Firstly, you might lean on those findings that show that we are, in general, wrong about certain things to do with flavour perception. For instance, there are findings that show that we're wrong if we think, as lots of us probably do, that what happens in flavour perception happens largely in the mouth. And in some unusual cases, we're wrong if we think that what is perceived in flavour perception is in the mouth. I try to argue that there's no straightforward route from accepting that the scientific findings show that we're wrong in these ways, to accepting that they show that we're wrong about the modality to which experiences of flavour belong. The second way in which one might try to use the findings without adjudicating between naturalism and non-naturalism is to argue that the claim that flavours are perceived partly with a sense of smell ought to be accepted in virtue of the explanatory power it has in psychology. I try to argue that it's not obvious that it does have any such explanatory power. I suspect that some resistance to non-naturalism might be down to the fact that it can come across as a sort of flat earthism, or at least as denying that science can tell us anything at all about our senses. In the concluding section, I try briefly to speak to this worry. I point out that it's no commitment of non-naturalism about our everyday conception of the senses that we folk and scientific psychology are merely talking past one another when each talks of the senses. In fact, non-naturalism might provide a way of avoiding having to accept that that is the case. According to non-naturalism, our everyday conception of the senses is non-committal about the way in which perception is brought about by the effect of the environment on our internal perceptual equipment. Its being thus non-committal would, if non-naturalism were true, be precisely that which would leave room for science to tell us a very great deal about our senses. I very much look forward to discussing these issues with our full commentators and with other contributors too.